Regular meeting number 53 will now come to order. Please stand for the playing of the national anthem. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, the members of Columbus City Council again ask for your presence and guidance as they conduct the business of our city. In these difficult times, especially as the electorate prepares to choose candidates for elective office in the near future, we ask you to give to the voters the wisdom and discernment to select well those who will best serve the needs of our communities. These members of City Council realize that they serve at the pleasure of the citizens of our community, and they pray that they always have their best interests before their eyes. In all they do, Lord, assist the members of this Council to be strong, wise, and diligent in their service of this city and her citizens. We're privileged tonight to welcome our newest member of this council, council member, the Honorable Shannon Harden, who replaces the esteemed Troy Miller. We ask your blessing on Councilman Harden and pray that his presence and action will add to the work of this council and enhance the quality of life in our city. Most of all, Lord, give all of us whatever we need to continue to build this community into the best possible environment for our children, our elderly, the poor, the vulnerable, and the marginalized, and indeed for all people, whoever or wherever they may be, that all of us may enjoy the rewards of a good life, a life shared together for one another's good. Amen. Amen. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden Klein, Mills Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden Klein, Mills Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Our first order of business this evening is to elect a new President Pro Tem of Council due to the resignation of former President Pro Tem A. Troy Miller. Are there any nominations for President Pro Tem of City Council? I move that Council Member Michelle Mills be elected as President Pro Tem of Columbus City Council. Council President Ginther, it's with the greatest pleasure that I second that motion, my good friend, Councilmember Mills. Thank you, uh, Council uh, Member Paley and Council Member Klein. Are there any other nominations for President Pro Tem? Seeing none, uh, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Craig Harden Klein, Mills Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Congratulations, President Pro Tem Mills. Next, I'd like to ask the city clerk to read updated committee assignments into the record. 
Finance Committee, Council Member Priscilla R. Tyson, Chairperson, Committee Members Mills, Paley, and President Ginther. Health and Human Services Committee, Council Member Priscilla R. Tyson, Chairperson, Committee Members Mills, Paley, President Ginther. Workforce Development Committee, Council Member Priscilla R. Tyson, Chairperson, Council Members Mills, Harden, President Ginther. Recreation and Parks Committee, Council Member Herschel F. Craig, Chairperson, Committee Members Tyson, Klein, and President Ginther. Veterans Affairs Committee, Council Member Herschel F. Craig, Chairperson, Committee Members Klein, Paley, and President Ginther. Public Service and Transportation Committee, Council Member Shannon G. Harden, Chairperson, Committee Members Tyson, Paley, and President Ginther. Small and Minority Business Development Committee, Council Member Shannon G. Harden, Chairperson, Committee Members Mills, Craig, and President Ginther. Public Safety and Judiciary Committee, Council Member Zachary M. Klein, Chairperson, Committee Members Mills, Craig, President Ginther. Technology Committee, Council Member Zachary M. Klein, Chairperson, Committee Members Paley, Harden, and President Ginther. Public Utilities Committee, Council Member Zachary M. Klein, Chairperson, Committee Members Craig, Paley, President Ginther. Development Committee, Council Member Michelle M. Mills, Chairperson, Committee Members Klein, Tyson, President Ginther. Education Committee, Council Member Michelle M. Mills, Chairperson, Committee Members Tyson Craig, and President Ginther. Environment Committee, Council Member Michelle M. Mills, Chairperson, Committee Members Klein, Harden, and President Ginther. Administration Committee, Council Member Eileen Y. Paley, Chairperson, Committee Members Craig, Harden, President Ginther. Rules and Reference Committee, Council President Andrew J. Ginther, Chairperson, Committee Members Klein, Mills, and Craig. Zoning Committee, Council Member Andrew J. Ginther, Chairperson, all, all Council Members serve on that committee. Thank you, uh, Clerk Blevins. This week's communications received by the City Clerk's Office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the City Bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Not at this time. Thank you. Uh, at this point, are there any resolutions or announcements by members of Council? Council Member Craig. Not this evening, thank you. Council Member Harden. No, thank you. Council Member Klein. Council President, I'd just like to recognize uh, a special group of approximately 60 Ohio State students. Could you please stand if you're with Ohio State and were with me prior to Council? These are... Council President, these are not only uh, the best and brightest that Ohio State has to offer, but it's the best and brightest from around the world, uh, from countries out of Asia, Africa, Europe, and South America. Uh, these students are uh, studying at the Ohio State University and have come down to Council prior. I uh, had the chance to, to witness Council Member Hardin's uh, swearing-in ceremony and really witness history, witness the democratic process of seeing someone sworn in uh, and, uh, and and did a question and answer and I learned a lot from them and they learned a, uh, maybe a couple things about city government from me but I really appreciate them coming down to council I believe they had uh, midterms or finals today so they've been busy studying this is their reprieve to come down to Columbus City Council Council President um, so thank you for coming and thank you for being part of this group and let's give them another round of applause Well, if this is what you do to burn off energy during finals, we've got to find you a better social life. But uh, welcome. Uh, we're thrilled to have you in our, our great city and uh, your city hall. Council Member Mills. Council Member Paley. Thank you, President Ginther. I have several resolutions this evening. Um, my first resolution is to recognize Shadowbox Live as they celebrate their 25th anniversary. We have several guests to speak about, about this resolution. If I could have Stacy Board and Steve Geyer please move to the podium. Tonight we are offering a resolution to recognize 25 years of outstanding music and theater that Shadowbox Live has brought to Central Ohio. The theater company employs 55 full and part-time ensemble members who produce a wide range of shows and run the companies on a day-to-day -day basis. Shadowbox Live produces world-class performances including sketch comedy and rock and roll, original rock operas, traditional musicals, drama, dance theater, and new media. For the past five years, the theater has contribu contributed over $1 million back to the community in ticket donations, gallery proceeds, educational services, volunteer appreciation, and community events. This year, Shadowbox Live will deliver over 500 performances 
of 20 different shows. And I just want to mention before I give the, before I ask for adoption that in collaboration with the Columbus Museum of Art, Shadowbox Live is presenting Gallery of Echoes, the CMA Experience, a 21 song cycle multimedia performance where the artwork takes center stage. Original rock and roll, advocative video and contemporary dance complements the visual artwork selected from the museum's permanent collection for this one of a kind production. If you have not seen it, I very strongly recommend it. It really will change art for a lifetime and hopefully put the city of Columbus on the map. Before I give the floor to Stacy and Steve, I move for passage. Craig Harden Klein, Mills Paley Tyson, President Ginther. The floor is yours. I can't thank you enough for this honor. It is always a great privilege to have the opportunity to do any work of any kind as a life's work in front of a city such as Columbus and to, to be able to create for all of these years with a supportive environment, a supportive audience, a city that understands what we have to offer has been an extraordinary gift to us. When we got started 25 years ago, it is absolutely fair to say that we had no earthly idea what we were doing. We had no money. We had no meaningful education in terms of what we were doing. So we were just trying. And Columbus tends to be the sort of place that people are willing to give you a chance as long as you're willing to work. It's just that simple. We had no good ideas. We had no real skills but we had a tremendous work ethic. And people saw that, and they saw the passion, and were willing to come back, and were willing to stick with us until we figured out how to do it correctly. Now, that took most of the 25 years. <laughs> but we do have a clue now, and I'll be honest with you, I think in large measure, that's due to the fact that the folks in the city of Columbus have been willing to stick with us and go through the process, to give us their feedback, to be honest, to be forthright, and stand by us through all our trials and tribulations. I can't thank the city enough. I can't thank you enough for recognizing both Shadowbox and the fact that the citizens of this great city stood behind us for all of those years and helped make this possible. Thank you so, so much. Councilmember Mills. I just want to say thank you to you all. One of my fondest memories uh, with Shadowbox is the STEM Rocks production that you did. You helped some great Linda McKinley STEM students put the A in STEM for STEAM, including the arts, and they've, they've just embraced it from day one, and you all worked with them and helped them put on a great production, and I think you really ignited a lot of art appreciation and learning and looking at science, technology, engineering, art, and math in a different way and making it STEAM for a lot of great students. So thank you, and I'm very grateful for your time and energy in all the 25 years when Whenever you had a clue or didn't have a clue, it's all looked good to me. <laughs> so thank you. Councilmember Tyson. Thank you, Chairwoman Paley. Just want to say congratulations to you. I know just last Thursday you were honored to win um, the GCAC Awards at the Partnership um, Awards Luncheon, and you did receive the highest award and certainly got a, a $10,000 check as well as, um, but showed your innovation and risk risk in the show that Councilman Paley just mentioned. And just want to say congratulations for, for taking that risk. And also, I think that it's so important that I make a talk about PNC, because PNC Arts Alive are those kind of types of grants. I want to make sure that we're mirroring um, different groups, different arts groups together so that, um, bringing art groups together so that we can continue to build audiences. And so I'm just excited excited for you winning that award and your, your 25 years and hopefully this production will go to other cities around the country and all over the world. So congratulations to you on the fine work that you've been doing for our community. Thank you so much. Steve, if you can give us the dates that Gallery of Echoes is reopening, that might help our listening audience. Yes, we're uh, reopening the Gallery of Echoes on November the 5th and it runs through November 15th. 16th. 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 I know. Yes, she does. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you, President Ginther. I have one more resolution tonight to recognize October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It is my honor um, to serve as a member of the task force that dealt with this very issue. We have several guests to speak up that, about this resolution. I would ask that Columbus Urban League President and CEO Stephanie Hightower come to the podium along with most Miss Toby Furman and her guests from Jewish Family Services. In addition, I would also ask that Director Bell of the Community Relations Commission also come forward. Tonight we are offering a resolution to recognize October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. In 1987, the first Domestic Violence Awareness Month was observed with the U.S. Congress following suit in 1989, designating October of that year as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Domestic violence is a pattern of abusive and coercive behaviors, including physical, sexual, and psychological attacks, as well as economic coercion that adults or adolescents use against their intimate partners. Such violence, both psychological and physical, increase the likelihood of damaging behavioral and mental conditions, such as depression and suicidal behaviors. And despite tremendous progress, an average of nearly 20 people per minute are victims of physical violence by an intimate partner in the United States, equating to nearly 10 million women and men per year. Columbus Police respond to approximately six to 7,000 domestic violence calls and approximately 4,000 domestic violence charges are filed at the Franklin County Municipal Court. Domestic violence represents a set of crimes that transcends gender, race, age, religion, and socioeconomic status. Observing Domestic Violence Awareness Month serves to raise awareness about the needs to eliminate violence and all other forms of oppression against all communities and families in the city of Columbus nationwide year-round. The guests that I brought down this evening to discuss this issue both have very good programs in this area. But before we get to our guests, I'm going to move that the resolution be passed. Greg Harden, Klein, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. We have brought down the President and CEO of the Columbus Urban League, Stephanie Hightower. According to the Center for Family Safety and Healing right here in Columbus, a child is abused or neglected every 10 minutes in Ohio and nearly one in three women will experience physical violence by an intimate partner in their lives. The evidence we've been seeing is deeply disturbing in the NFL. And the lack of response from the NFL has been nearly as disconcerting as the facts. One of our Columbus community leaders and sports legends in her own right is leading a charge to call upon the NFL to better address family violence. Stephanie Hightower, President and CEO of the Columbus Urban League, Central Ohio's oldest and most successful urban family advocate. What can you tell us about <laughs> domestic violence, Ms. Hightower? Thank you, Council Member Paley, President Ginther, and members of Council. You know, at the Columbus Urban League, our mission is very simple. It's to help more individuals and families overcome poverty and achieve self-sufficiency. That's today's civil rights struggle. We believe we're an effective force in poverty relief by working as a trusted community partner who helps solve the daily disasters of life without basic necessities. Persevere through the challenges of change and overcome the many barriers that too often lock families into intergenerational poverty. Many of those that we work with struggle to move on and break free from family violence. To that point, I have shared a print copy of one of our infographics that you should have in front of you. Um, and it's a single mother's story whose life was thrown into crisis by family violence. No single issue keeps families in poverty. Likewise, no single solution makes a family healthy and self-sufficient. This mother now participates in family therapy. One of her sons, is learning from our Head Start team how to control the anger that sprang up after seeing his mom hit. And he and all the children will benefit from his mom's progress as she goes through our workforce development and training program. But for all the coaching and advocacy we do, we know the scars of family violence go much further than, than skin deep. That is partly why I was outraged with the NFL. They fumbled a lot 
And then when they finally convened a panel of four women to advise them on how to better promote safe families, they failed to include any women of color. That's despite the fact that all of the NFL incidents involved black families. And despite the fact that African American women are disproportionately victims of family violence in this country. So I spoke up and I opened my mouth, right? And when the National Urban League president heard my concerns, he made sure that I had a seat at a table with the Black Women's Roundtable in the National Urban League when we met with them at the end of September. I told them about the families we serve in Columbus, Ohio, and that cultural, cultural relevancy had to be a part of the programmatic efforts that they were looking at in the future. And I told them that as a former professional athlete and president and chairman of USA Track and Field, I thought it was time that we recognize that being a professional athlete carries just as much responsibility as it does benefit. Our community sets standards for high-profile athletes, and we have to do so. Children admire them, and they imitate them. And adults, uh, subliminally or not, take cues from their behavior about what's socially acceptable. So living up to those standards is part of the privilege of competing at sports highest levels. And yes, we all understand that we send mixed messages in some ways. We demand that our athletes compete aggressively at the very highest intensity and then with all the encompassing focus on winning. But that cannot become an excuse for violence at home. Everyone connected with sports must be vigilant, vigilant, knowing that the actions of athletes have great repercussions on the field as well as off. And finally, professional athletes have long been one of the most diverse arenas, attracting the best athletes from all races, ethnicities, and genders. So I believe the NFL must be engaged with the same diverse set of experiences, backgrounds, and cultures in order to craft a policy that truly reflects all families. So I've been invited to return um, uh, Council Member Paley to New York and share my perspectives with Commissioner Goodell so we can move this important dialogue forward. And I'm honored and earnest in my commitment to share, continue to share these perspectives on behalf of the Columbus Urban League and all of the families that we are impacted by family violence in our community. Thank you, Ms. Hightower. Director Bell, if you just want to give us a few words on how the Columbus Community Relations Commission is dealing with our issue of the day. Well, I, I, I would definitely like to do that. So thank you so much, President Ginther, Council Member Paley, Chair Paley, and members of Council. Um, you know, I belong to the IOR, which is the International Association of Official Human Rights Agencies, and also as a director of CRC, we feel that the local governments are on the front lines of addressing domestic violence. Indeed, state and local agencies and cities and county governments are also recognizing freedom from domestic violence as a human right. Because October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and November 25th is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Freedom from violence is a human right. We must bring awareness to government and non-government agencies to ensure quality for men and women on an equal basis, which include taking steps to eliminate violence against women. A number of human rights agreements call specifically for proactive measures that promote gender equality and protection against gender discrimination in all of its forms, including measures aimed at identifying, eliminating, and preventing gender-motivated violence. So we thank you, Council Member Paisley, for the resolution and creating that awareness for the elimination of violence against women, and our office will continue the same to bring awareness to this problem. Thank you, Director Bell. The next guests that we have are from Jewish Family Services, Toby Furman, and guests. I'm going to let you talk about your programs, but one of the interesting programs that they have actually deals with teen domestic violence um, called Let's Talk Respect. Ms. Furman? Thank you, Councilmember Tiley. Uh, Paley for bringing us down here to be recognized for the work that we do in teens, teen girls and teen boys. Um, Ms. Hightower, you know, started with a startling statistic. And I brought with me my guest is Lisa Carroll, who is the program director of healthy relationships at Jewish Family Services. And I'm going to let her talk to the work that we're doing. Again, thank you for this opportunity to be able to talk about our Let's Talk Respect 
We, as response to the alarming statistics, we are a grassroots initiative. We began four years ago when we recognized the huge gap in services here in our city that two, one in three girls and one in five boys will experience some form of emotional, physical, sexual, or cyber abuse. And we believe that primary prevention needed to begin. So Jewish Family Services launched the Let's Talk Respect program, which year one consisted of the largest ever that I believe community resource uh, affair. It was an event held at the Hilton Easton. It was attended by 550 girls and moms and mentors representing over 54 middle school and high school students. We had a Project Runway fashion show with our partner TJ Maxx based upon inner beauty and the ability for every girl to have a voice and be what they wanted to be. We had a speaker from a tragic incident that occurred in New Albany where Lee Balin was murdered by her boyfriend since she had been with since seventh grade. Our program then began to expand to the importance of creating social change in our community. And therefore, we adopted a research-based program called Safe Dates. And we stand before you today to share with you that last year we were proud to be able to educate over 200 girls and actually be involved in community education and also at two schools, both Reynoldsburg and Gahanna, where their city council and their mayors and businesses helped us to form our own resolution, a day of respect and safe dating in their communities. Our girls are empowered with skills that helps them to recognize unhealthy relationship characteristics, how to help friends, and to help to enforce Tina Kushner's law, which occurred in 2010, requiring our schools to provide teen dating violence education, both middle school and high school. And sadly, that is not being done pretty much throughout the schools. Our girls are our social change agents for the future, and JFS is pleased to be able to help give them those new schools to do that, those new skills to do that. This year, our Purple Teen Party will occur March 1st. It will be at the Hyatt Regency. Last year, we sold out with 1,000 within two weeks, so please look forward to that. But we are also very excited about a, a citywide social media program that we will be launching December 15th called Selfie Respect. Our agency is committed to reaching both young and old and helping people with the real message of today, which is respect self and respect others, and we will have a community free of violence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilmember Tyson. I thank you, Chairwoman Paley, for bringing um, these organizations down to share what they're doing in regards to domestic violence. Certainly appreciate the work that you're doing, uh, President and Chairwoman. Um, Stephanie Hightower for the work that you're doing, especially taking this, this message nationwide, as well as I want to certainly thank Toby for the work that you're doing. I know the council is a funder of this program. I've been, been, this has been one of my um, uh, amendments every year, so thank you. We certainly are a council that truly appreciates the work that we're doing to ensure that, that we're going to stop one in three individuals being involved in domestic violence and dating teen violence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I have Council President Ginther. Thank you, uh, Council Member Paley. Council Member Tyson? Yes, um, thank you, President Ginther. I have uh, a resolution, and it's resolution number 0177X 2014. And as I begin to read the resolution, I'm going to ask a number of individuals who are here for this resolution to start um, walking towards the podium. And so, um, everyone that is here, Mr. Bob Lichty, Donna Bates, Linda Henry, everyone that's here representing the south side of Columbus to please walk towards the podium. 
This resolution is to recognize Red Rib Ribbon Week and to celebrate a drug-free Columbus, whereas the National Family Partnership and a handful of concerned and determined parents establish a national grassroots nonprofit organization to lead and support families and communities in nurturing the full potential of healthy, drug-free youth. And whereas underage drinking costs the citizens of Ohio $2.9 billion and 21.1% of the alcohol consumed is by underage drinkers, and whereas three out of four children in protective custody in Ohio were removed from their homes because of a substance abusing parent, and whereas in the past decade babies born with drug addiction increased sixfold, whereas alcohol and other drugs were involved in 78% of violent crimes, 83% of property crimes, and 77% of public order or weapons offenses, and probation parole violations, and whereas public awareness is is, a key, is key to effectively preventing drug abuse and gambling addiction, to educating Ohio's youth about the dangers of alcohol, tobacco, drug abuse, and gambling. And whereas substance, whereas substance use prevention programs can improve the behavioral health of communities as well as save four to five dollars for every dollar invested in drug abuse treatment, and counseling, and whereas this year's Red Ribbon Celebration theme, Love Yourself, Don't Do Drugs, highlights a year-round message of being alcohol, tobacco, and other drug-free. And whereas the Southern Gateway Substance Abuse Solutions Committee, comprised of the Southside residents, have declared October 25th and 26 to be Stand Up Against Addictions Weekend and has organized a series of events to com combat addictions, whereas business, media, social services, governments, schools, social service organizations, faith-based entities, safety forces, and individuals will demonstrate their commitment to a drug-free lifestyle by wearing and displaying red ribbons and posters during red, red ribbons and posters during this week-long celebration and participating in the South Side events. Therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby declare October 23rd through the 31st as Red Ribbon Week and October 24th and 25th to be the stand to be the South Side Stand Up Against Addictions Weekend. Be it further resolved that this council urges all Ohioans to wear a red ribbon to participate in activities sponsored by your school and communities and make a commitment to a healthy drug fee lifestyle. I move for passage. Craig Harden Klein, Mills Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Who's going to speak? Um, good evening. And uh, thank you, uh, President Ginther and Columbus City Council, and especially uh, Councilperson Tyson, for the resolution this evening. Uh, this has been a community, first of all, I'm sorry, my name is Jim Griffin. I'm a member of South Columbus's community. I also chair the Columbus South Side Area Commission. Um, and I've been working with this incredible group, um, getting this event ready. Um, it, our, it's going to take place Saturday, October 25th, and I want to thank Judy Sarnecki and Joanne St. Clair for all of their efforts in leading, leading this group. And I just want to say on a personal note that uh, October 25th would have been my brother Patrick's 49th birthday, and he died from cirrhosis at age 41. So this is a very important cause for me. Thank you. Councilmember Craig. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Tyson, for offering this resolution. Uh, I see many of you and know many of you that are, that are standing here today. The importance of this is I see government, uh, I see nonprofit, uh, nonprofit involvement, I see the business community involved, and certainly see the young people that are here. And uh, Jim, like, like you, uh, I've got uncles on both sides of my family that died, died of cirrhosis of the liver. And nothing more important, and I hope the young people understand this, that you have value. And uh, we have great expectations for you and what you will achieve uh, for the city of Columbus. We have, a, we have a, a young council member sitting here tonight that is an extraordinary person. And uh, we want you to know uh, that uh, we expect 
uh, we are committed to you uh, to be all that you can be. And so I appreciate so much all of you being here tonight uh, and to continue to work hard. I see Linda standing there that through it all, through her health issues, uh, always involved, and many of you, uh, through your personal struggles in life, but you care about the whole community uh, and families, and that's really what we're about. And so I thank all of you for coming down. I think, uh, thank you certainly for your continual work uh, and involvement, not only on the south side of Columbus, Columbus, but making our city better. God bless you, and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Councilor McCraig. I'm just going to ask that um, each of you have the opportunity to share your names. I know we have Mary Haven here. I want these young men to share their names from Boys and Girls Club. So could you step to the podium and just briefly say your name and if you represent the organization. Thank you. Lily Banner, uh, Reed Posack, Civic Co-Chair in the Columbus Southside Area Commission, District 9. Joanne St. Clair, proud to be the neighborhood liaison for the Great South Side and manager of the South Side Neighborhood Pride Center. Linda Henry, co chair of Repose X Tilton Village Committee and South Side activist. Judy Zarnecki, lead consultant, Southern Gateway Initiative. Javon Ross, the Boys and Girls Club. Rayshawn Long, Boys and Girls Club. Quayshawn Long, Boys and Girls Club in South High School. I'm Jenny Campbell Rue, and I'm with a Mary Haven's Gambling Program, and so I'm the newbie with this because I've only been here a year, but they have been, they've just welcomed me and made me feel welcome. I also want to tell you that for the day, uh, Columbus Public Health, Columbus Public Schools, and Columbus Public Rec and Apps is also involved in today's program and in, in the program that will happen on Saturday. Daniel Custer, Site Director at the South Side Boys and Girls Club. Louis Eros, Hungarian Village Society, and also the Block Watch Community Meetings for the South Side. Ruth Bell, and I am a member of the Reeb Hosack Stilton Village uh, Civic. Bob Leakley, Executive Director, Parsons Avenue Merchants Association. Samantha Hudson, I'm an intern at the Southside Pride Center. Robert Dickershard, Block Watch Community Center for the South Side and Hungarian Village Society. Jonna Bates, Reposex Stilton Village and the Southern Gateway Initiative. Thank you again. Thank you for coming down this evening. This is a diverse group of individuals who are certainly to, who are focused on Red Ribbon Week, but also ensuring that. We have, you know, drug and alcohol is not a part of everyone's, every, and gambling is not a part of everyone's daily life because we know it does not help people to move forward in their lives when they have those type of addictions. So thank you for being here, um, coming down on a rainy Monday night to, be, to show your support of the work that you're doing in your community. Thank you so very much. I also have a couple, one, an announcement that I also know that Columbus Public Health wants to make some comments uh, uh, regarding um, what the city is doing in, in a response to Ebola. So, but I want to first mention that October is also, there's a lot, I know a lot of, of events that happen 
um, each month, but October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and breast cancer is the most common cancer among women worldwide and the second most common cancer overall. In 2014, an estimated 232,030 cases of invasive breast cancer were diagnosed in the U.S. alone. African American women in the U.S. have the highest death rates of all racial ethnic groups and have a more aggressive type of cancer and have fewer resources. So no matter who you are or where you live, understanding breast cancer is important. But the most important thing to know is, is this. Diagnosis is not a death sentence. Breast cancer can be treated. Prevention is key. And there are a number of organizations in this community who are providing free and low-cost mammograms. So I would say that please contact your health care provider, contact Columbus Public Health. We have a lot of resources that people, to tell people where they can go and get these services. And that is all of my announcements. I now want to turn the floor over to the Assistant Health Commissioner and Chief Nursing Officer for the City of Columbus, Nancy Bechtel. I will also comment that earlier today, a number of elected officials from the nation, nationwide to the local elected officials were on a phone call today with Dr. Long um, and um, sharing what the city is doing, and that's why Nancy Bechtel was here. I also want to thank our safety forces, because I know over the weekend that we certainly had to engage them um, when we had a, a scare in this community that turned out to be a hoax, but the safety forces were there and ensuring that all the proper precautions were taken to move forward. So with that, again, um, Assistant Health Commissioner Nancy Bechtel. Thank you. Councilman Ginther. Councilman Tyson and other members of council. So we know that there's three countries primarily affected by Ebola in West Africa. At this time, there's been no cases of Ebola in Columbus or Franklin County. Columbus is overall at very low risk of its residents getting Ebola. You can only get Ebola from touching the body fluids of a person who is symptomatically sick with Ebola. We are working closely with our own staff, with local hospitals and other response partners and first responders to ensure that the community is prepared and that systems are in place to protect the public. We are currently in a status of what we call incident command, which is a system for unified communication and resource allocation. This is a process that helps us get ready just in case. We are or have monitored a number of residents who have traveled back from one of the three countries affected with Ebola, and again, none has developed Ebola. We are working on our own care policies. We're looking at our quarantine procedures, our infectious disease investigation procedures, which we do every day for other diseases as well, and we're starting to outreach to local West African residents to help them have education about Ebola. So what can other folks do to be safe? First, people can get their flu shot. We've had one death in the United States of somebody from Ebola, and it was unfortunately somebody who didn't get the health care as quickly as they needed it. And yet every year we have upwards of 25,000 people in the United States that die from complications related to the flu. So get your flu shot. Common sense, wash your hands, cover your cough, stay home if you're sick. Don't travel to the affected countries as a general citizen and recognize the symptoms of Ebola if you know somebody that has come back from another country and maybe a neighbor that you're um, in contact with. So the symptoms would be uh, a headache, a fever of greater than 100.4 stomach ache, vomiting or diarrhea, or any unusual bleeding. And again, that person would have had to either travel to one of those three countries or been in contact, physical contact, with somebody that was sick with Ebola. We tell people to assess, isolate, and activate. So if you assess that somebody may have the symptoms, isolate them, so ask them to stay in their home or some private room, and call EMS, call 911. They will come and help assess whether the person's truly sick. There is a hotline for Ebola. The number is 1-866-800-1404. Or people can go to our website at www.columbus.gov slash public health. And we have a number of materials there that people can print out and use. Thank you so very much for that update. And that's all I have in my committees. 
Thank you, uh, Council Member Tyson. Tonight, I have resolution 0182X-2014 to endorse issue for the Franklin County Children's Services levy on the November 4th ballot. First, I'd like to move for adoption. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Greg Harden Klein, Mills Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Resolution adopted. I'd like to invite uh, Chip Spinning, Executive Director of Franklin County Children's Services, uh, forward to the podium. Franklin County Children's Services provides protection, care, and permanency for children in our community who are abused, neglected, and dependent. Each year, the agency helps more than 30,000 children by investigating allegations of child abuse and neglect, helping parents resolve family challenges, and placing children in temporary foster care or permanent adoptive homes when necessary. On November 4th, Children's Services is asking Franklin County voters to renew its property tax levy so that the agency can continue to provide vitally important services to children and families. The renewal will not raise property taxes. Mr. Spinning, thank you for being here tonight. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about issue four and why our constituents ought to support it. Well, thank you, President Genther and council members. We appreciate the continued support. Um, I'd like to, the opportunity to just say a few minutes about children's services and what our role in the community is. As a child protection agency, our mandate is to focus on serving the community's most vulnerable children and ensuring their safety, permanency, and well-being. To continue our present level of services that we provide to abused and neglected children, we need the community support on issue four, the 1.9 mill renewal levy, which, as President Ginther said, will not increase your taxes. There will be no increase in taxes. However, without the renewal of this levy, which generates 25% of our revenue, or $46 million annually, we won't be able to provide the vitally needed services to abused and neglected children in our community. Briefly, just a few accomplishments that we've had. Franklin County Children's Services is the only mandated agency by law to provide protection to abused and neglected children within the county. We serve over 30,000 children each year within this community. And as you can imagine, they come from every neighborhood within the county. They represent every social economic group. And as you can imagine, based on the resolutions here today, with poverty, addiction, domestic violence, uh, people who choose the wrong partner, uh, delinquent or dependent youth, our numbers continue to rise. But with that being said, the agency is committed to keeping children with their birth families as long as they're safe. But when removal must happen, our first recourse is to place children with their relatives or kinship placements. Through a concerted effort, we've done just that. Since 2009, we've experienced a 65% increase in the number of kinship placements, which is better for children and provides better outcomes, and they return home much sooner. Another statistic that we're proud of is that since in the last five years, 255 children who have been abused and neglected have gone on to pursue college degrees. Another statistic that we're proud of is that we've been good stewards of taxpayer dollars coming in under budget in the last seven years. These are the many reasons in which we feel that it's important that we continue the services that we currently provide. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments for Mr. Spinning? Council Member, uh, President Pro Tem Mills. Thank you, President Genther. Uh, I want to say thank you for your team's leadership and work in, in our city, and I hope that everyone understands that the investment in this levy is a direct investment in children. The sound leadership that you provide to Franklin County Children's Services really makes sure the direct benefits are to the children. And some people take it as a cliche and say it's all about the children, but in the case of children's services, a direct benefit to them and their lives and who they'll be in the future. Everyone deserves a right of a happy and safe family, and you provide that for so many children and thank you and for you and your team and continuing the work of children's services even though sometimes it's a very tough job to do you all do it with good dignity leadership and professionalism and I thank you for that thank you councilmember Tyson thank you chip I just want to say uh, again thank you to you and your organization I know that um, that you have a 24-hour hotline that gets about 2,500 calls every month regarding children and, and their safety. 
uh, a number of your colleagues have, um, people that work with you, have been to this council. We've given them resolutions on the work that they do, thinking about the SEMBA program, and I really appreciate that work. Uh, I know that you have a new kinship care program, which is wonderful, trying to make sure that those young, that young, pe that people have the opportunity to stay with their own families as opposed to going into another environment where they have to begin to learn that family, and, it's, and that can be a traumatic experience for them. Uh, also, the Ed Pass. Um, appreciate that, that their young people are finishing high school and going on to higher learning and, um, and also, you know, so they can become, go out and go to work. And then lastly, I know we've spent a lot of time together recently just with the conversations with youth and just really appreciate that work because it's so important that we understand what's going on with our young people. And just as you said, the, the different types of resolutions we've given out today are certainly those kinds of issues those young people have talked to us about. So I do appreciate your leadership. I appreciate your staff. I saw Deborah Armstrong here. I appreciate your staff and the work that you do each and every day to ensure that children have the opportunity to be in safe environments and have the opportunity to be able to grow up and be able to reach their full potential. And so this isn't a tax increase or anything like that. This is just continuing to do the work that you've been doing, which has been tremendous. So uh, I'm total support of this work, and thank you for what you do. Thank you so much. We couldn't do it without all the support of the committed staff that we have, all the volunteers, and uh, you know we're just happy to continue to do the work. Councilmember Craig, uh, thanks very much, uh, President Genther. Let me also uh, uh, acknowledge the work of, of uh, Children's Services. As the simple truth is, is that all of our children need to be in a safe environment. Um, I know that Ms. Calloway is not here tonight, but Doris Calloway certainly is, has been a tremendous advocate for, for children and families for many, many years, and as well as other staff. Um, and certainly we acknowledge your work, the kinship program to continue to connect families with children uh, is vitally important. And uh, I would just say to the community, um, you know, we need to continue to do all that we can uh, to support our children, to support our families in a way uh, that will be helpful to them in future generations. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Craig. Mr. Spinning, best of luck, and uh, let me give you this resolution of support from Columbus City Council. Thank you. We, we appreciate it. Any uh, announcements from our elected officials? Uh, City Auditor's Office? City Attorney's Office? This time I request that the following ordinance be removed from the consent action portion of the agenda. In Finance 2331-2014. Any other requests by members of Council for the removal of an ordinance or resolution from the consent action portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30-day legislation by the city clerk. So Sarah, second. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden, Klein, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Will the clerk now read into the record the orange numbers of 30-day legislation on tonight's agenda for first reading? Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinances 2314-2333-2014. Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 2081, 2094, 2117, 2158, 2160, 2168, 2184, 2200, 2217, 2220, 2225, 2231, 2250, and 2252-2014. Technology Committee Ordinances 1856, 2205, 2221, and 2297-2014. The following ordinances appear in our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read the ordinance numbers of each into the record? 
Finance Committee Ordinances 2063, 2247-2251-2014. -2 Health and Human Services Committee Ordinances 2162, 2211-2268-2014. -2 Recreation and Parks Committee Ordinances 2138, 2254, and 2255-2014. Public Service and Transportation Committee Resolution 175X-2014 and 176X-2014. Ordinances 2064, 2130, 2199, 2203, 2207, 2208, 2210, 2219, 2265, 2266, 2014. Public Safety and Judiciary Committee Ordinances 1983, 2074, 2104, 2114, 2241, 2242, 2246, 2248, and 2291 2014. Public Utilities Committee Resolution 170X Ordinances 2013, 2115, 2159, 2161, 2179, and 2310 2014. Development Committee. Ordinances 2233, 2256, 2257, 2258, 2296, and 2329. 2014 Administration Committee Ordinance 2186-2014 Appointments from the Mayor's Office numbered A0172, 173, 174, 175, 176, 177, 178, 179, 180, 181, 184, 185, 186, 187, 188, 189, 190, 193, 194, 195, 196, 197, and 198 2014. Thank you, uh, Clerk Blevins. We do have one uh, speaker on the consent agenda this evening, Mr. Nathaniel G. Wilkins. Mr. Wilkins, welcome to Council Chambers. If you'd make your way to the podium, share your name, address, any organizations you represent. It appears you have signed up to speak in support of 2296-2014 and the Development Committee uh, on the Consent Agenda. Mr. Wilkins? 1612 Arlington Avenue, Mr. Latane George Wilkins, Chairman of Solar Vacant and Development Property in North Linden area. Um, I just got three questions. Um, I'd just like to know where this money is going to be used for, for, for $77,300. Seven dollars and forty cent, but also, um, I would like to see more money of two thousand uh, two hundred ninety-seven dollars and forty-four four thousand fifty-six and seventy cents. So again, um, I would love to see more money to be idolized for urban development somewhere here. But uh, again, I'd like to more more clarification what this money is going to be used for and idolized for. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Any questions or comments for Mr. Wilkins? Director Shoney, any uh, additional information you can offer on 2296? Uh, on 2296, this is money from uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development that went um, unused for a project. We're putting that back to Housing and Urban Development, but that money will be coming back to the city for use in other housing projects. Great. If you could just have uh, a member of your team follow up, Mr. Wilkins, see if he has any other questions that we can clear up for him. I'd appreciate it. Any other questions or comments from council members regarding the consent agenda? If not, we have a motion for approval of these items designated as consent actions. Is there a sec? Clerk, call the roll by voice. Craig? Yes. Harding? Yes. Klein? Rose? Yes, with the exception of 0176X-2014, on which I am abstaining. Perry? Yes. Tyson? Yes. President Ginther? Yes, consent agenda carries. We now proceed with second reading, a 30-day table in the emergency legislation. Although it doesn't appear on the agenda as the first committee, we're going to be going to the finance committee first because uh, Chairwoman Tyson has a piece of legislation we pulled from the consent agenda. Chairwoman Tyson? Do you thank bring forth the legislation? Yes, thank you. It is ordinance number 2331-2014. It's on page 9 on the agenda. It's to authorize the finance and management director on behalf of the, of the facilities management division to enter into a contract with AA 
Janitorial and Building Maintenance, Inc. for custodial services at the Columbus Police Academy, 1000 North Hague Avenue, to authorize expenditure of $197,000 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. Um, I move to request to table this indefinitely. Craig? Yes. Harding? Klein? Yes. Mills? Paley? Yes. Tyson? Yes. President Gunther? Thank you. If I could now move to rules and reference. Thank you. In rules and reference that I'm going to ask as I'm reading the title for Mindy Frank, our income tax division administrator, to start walking towards the podium, please. And in rules and reference, it's um, resolution number 2937, ordinance number 2937 2013, to amend chapter 361 income tax of the Columbus City Codes, 1959 sections. 361 06, 07, 11, 12, 16, 19, 20, 21, 22, 24, 25, 33, and 35 in order to ensure that the treatment previously afforded Columbus taxpayers pursuant to the Ohio Revised Code of 718 municipal income taxes is reflected in the city code sections being amended. With that, Ms. Frank, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council Member Tyson. Um, good evening, President Ginsler and members of Council. It sounds like a lot of language modification, but it really is changing out a word or two words um, to make our code similar to that of the Ohio Revised Code, Section 7, Chapter 718, Municipal Income Tax. Um, to give you a little bit of background regarding um, this ordinance that's before you this evening, in 2003, the 125th General Assembly passed amended substitute house bill 95, amending various sections of the Ohio Revised Code um, regarding municipal income tax. The Division of Income Tax adjusted uh, a, a, number, a number of tax issues based on these code changes and notified the uh, impacted taxpayers. At the time, the city code was not amended as applicable case law had allowed that more recently passed state statutes superseded local statute. On November 19th, 2013, the Ohio Supreme Court issued a carefully worded decision in Gessler versus City of Worthington Income Tax Board of Appeals, which addressed the General Assembly's powers to limit home rule exercised by municipalities by stating that when, that when home rule municipality exercises its taxing power under its constitutionally granted powers of local self-government, the municipality's powers were broader than that of the General Assembly. Due to this decision, the Columbus Income Tax Code must be amended to incorporate the language providing for the treatment which has been afforded Columbus taxpayers since 2004. It's important to note that this language imposes the same tax that's been imposed at state, federal, and all municipal levels in the state of Ohio. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you. Are do you have any comments you'd like to make on this? Uh, obviously, I support the ordinance and ask the uh, adoption of it. I asked, personally asked Ms. Frank to speak. I consider her the preeminent local tax administrator in the state of Ohio with, uh, I won't say how many years of experience with us, but uh, as Mindy indicated, uh, this does not provide for any new tax on anybody. We simply continue what we've been doing, but now we'll have it involved in the city code. I'd appreciate your adoption. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dorian. Thank you, Mindy, for sharing. No questions or comments? I move for passage. Craig Harden, Klein, Ross Peter Chasen, President Ginther. Thank you. That's all I have in my committees this evening. Thank you, uh, Council Member Tyson. Our next committee is the Recreation and Parks Committee. Council Member Craig chairs that committee. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, President Githler. I have one piece of legislation uh, in the Recreation and Parks Committee tonight. It is Ordinance 2343-2014 uh, to authorize and direct the Director of Recreation and Parks to modify the existing contract with Burgess and Nibel, Inc for the Sanders Park Phase 2 property assessment 
and Human Health Base Risk Assessment Project to authorize the City Auditor to transfer $309,000 within the Recreation and Parks bond, bond Fund to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Budget to authorize the expenditure of $289,000 with a contingency of $20,000 for a total of $309,000 from the Recreation and Parks Voted Bonds Fund and, and to declare an emergency. Uh, this ordinance authorized the Director of Recreation and Parks Department to modify the contract with Burgess and Nibel Inc. for additional uh, services to, pre to prepare plans, specifications, bidding documents, and voluntary action plan documentation for the uh, remediation of the contaminated soil uh, at uh, Saunders Park. Um, Director McKnight, I know that we have two speakers on, uh, on, this, um, uh, on this issue. Let me go ahead and proceed with the speakers, if I can, uh, uh, President uh, Genther, on this. First, um, I'd ask uh, Mr. Dana Messner, Mr. Messner, if you would please approach the podium uh, and uh, indi indicate any groups that you're representing uh, tonight. Uh, give your name and address, and sir, you have three minutes. Good evening, Council. Dana Messner with the Bronzeville Neighborhood Association, and I'm also sitting on the Near East Area Commission. And. Uh, two questions to start this. First, are the monies in the legislation being used to clean up the contaminated Saunders Park site? Or number two, are the monies in this legislation only being used to study or, or, and or plan to clean up the contaminated site? I'd like to have that made clear. So what I'm going to do is direct your questions uh, to Director McKnight, and I think we can get more clarification on that issue. I believe that these are dollars uh, being uh, used to study the issue. There will be subsequent legislation uh, regarding this matter, but I'd like for Director McKnight, if you would please begin to make comments regarding this. President Gintler, Chair Craig, members of Council. These funds are to modify the contract with Burgess and Nipel, who are our engineers. They have completed the phase two in the remedial action plan, which identified uh, options for the remediation of the contaminated soil. This contract is really the next phase where they will prepare the detailed plans, specifications, bid documents uh, for that remediation. Uh, it also includes uh, additional meetings with the Ohio EPA Technical Advisory Committee, which will be reviewing the plans and specifications as we move forward, and then also uh, providing documentation at the completion of the construction project where we do the remediation so that we can submit what's con called a NFA or a no further action letter to the Ohio EPA, ultimately with the goal of getting a response from the EPA that the site has been remediated and can be used again for the recreational purposes that we uh, uh, intend to use the site for. So in effect, I, I, I wouldn't call this additional study. We've studied it. We know what's there. We know what needs to be done. Now we need to do the engineering documents necessary to bid the work out. And we will be coming back to Council uh, late this year or the first of the year uh, with additional legislation for uh, award of a contract to actually perform the work uh, for the remediation. Uh, and I think that answers the question. Again, it's, it's not specifically to go in and clean the site itself, but we need to prepare the plans and specifications so that we can bid that work out to certified contractors who will actually come in and do the work, and this will provide that. Again, it, it is um, it's a little more detailed than, again, just bidding, uh, preparing plan specification because of the information and the documentation we have to provide uh, back to the EPA upon completion of the work to get the certifications that the site is clean. Also, due to the nature of this work, uh, part of this contract is for Burgess and Naples to be on site full time during the construction to assure that the remediation step uh, steps are taken in a way that uh, we're sure that we're getting the uh, the uh, cap that we need, the cover that we need, 
Uh, again, with clean soil, for example, the soil that's brought in for the cap is tested as it comes in. We, last thing we want to do is bring in soil and find out it has some contamination. So we do that as we go along as well. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. Mr. Mayor. I did not allow you to, or were there further comments? I know that you had those two specific questions. Uh, you still have time. Uh, were there other comments that you needed to make or questions that you needed to ask relative to this issue? Okay. All right. I'm continue. All right. Thank you very much for your information. Contaminated Saunders Park was identified by the federal EPA in 2005, and the City of Columbus was notified. 2010 through 2013, City of Columbus, Metropolitan Housing Authority, and Ohio State University created PACT, Partners Achieving Community Transformation, to improve the health, living conditions, and generally make the things better on the near east side between Interstate 71, Interstate 670, East Broad Street, and Allen Creek, which includes the contaminated Saunders Park site, which is approximately one half mile, half mile, excuse me, from Ohio State University Hospital East. I attended PACT, Partners Achieving Community Transformation Advisory Boarding, Board meetings frequently and numerous kitchen table meetings and large meetings with Goody Clancy to determine what the community wanted in the PACT area, including Saunders Park. During 100 plus PACT meetings with City of Columbus, Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority, Ohio State University, never was the contaminated Saunders Park mentioned. Never. 2012 through 2013, as a member of the Near East Area Commission, I attended Near East Area Commission meetings where Parks and Recreation Director McKnight presented plans to demolish and replace the Maryland pool, which has been done. I asked repeatedly during several meetings what the City of Columbus plan was for the entire Saunders Park site. I was told the city is only working in the southeast corner of Saunders Park where the pool has actually been replaced. There was no discussion. Nobody would continue discussion on the remainder of the park. The city park and Rex refused to say anything more on the total master plan. September 2013, I spoke before the Columbus City Council on non-agenda, reminding you that the city of Columbus had been notified by the federal EPA in 2005 that Saunders Park was contaminated. I asked what you're going to do and why nothing has been done to protect the kids who play in the park. The environmental racism issue. Environmental racism is great concern at this predominantly lower income, black African American neighborhood that surrounds the contaminated Saunders Park site. I ask you to table this legislation until the federal EPA is fully engaged in this contaminated Saunders Park site. The Ohio EPA has been neutered and ha has become powerless, not effective, in correcting the environmental racism experienced by this community. Mr. Mayor, sir, have, you. have you completed your comments? Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Director, further comments relative to this ordinance? Specifically related to the EPA ongoing well, the, the, issues. We, we, we first became aware of this. I first was contacted uh, by a member of the community um, and I don't have those dates in front of me, I didn't bring the entire file, but it's 2010, 2011 that there was concern. We then hired consultants who began the testing to determine uh, uh, if in fact we had a problem at that point in time. I'm not aware of a 2005 federal EPA, and I'd be happy to get with uh, Mr. Meissner, and if he's got some information that he could share with me, I'd be happy to, to take a look at that. The, um, uh, when we were notified, we hired consulting firms that began doing the testing to determine the contamination, determine if it was contaminated, what it was, and to go through that remedial action process, which has led us to where we are today. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, I guess, the answer I can give right now. The, the, it's my understanding that Ohio EPA has jurisdiction in this case, not the federal EPA. And talk, say again specifically what this legislation uh, is proposing to do. This ordinance will modify the contract we have with Burgess and Nipal Limited. Burgess and Nipal did the initial phase one, phase two study and the remedial action plan, which determined the options for remediating the contamination. Um, this contract now will take that remedial action plan. It will take it through the detailed design engineering process 
specifications, bid documents. They'll help us prepare the bid documents, help us through the bidding process, review the bids, help make a recommendation to us, which we'll bring back to City Council for award of a contract for construction. They will also be involved with uh, what's called technical assistance grant with the Ohio EPA, where we'll be meeting with the EPA through, this is the Ohio EPA, throughout the process to make sure that we're in compliance with their guidelines as we, as we go through that. Uh, if we have to have, we've had two community meetings here this year. If we need more, we will have more community meetings as we do that work. Then we will, uh, upon completion of the work, they will prepare all the certification documents that we need with what's called an NFA, no further action letter, which will be submitted to the Ohio EPA, which they will then, the EPA will review that and uh, ultimately give us back that certification that the site has been remediated and is safe to use. Uh, our schedule for that uh, right now is to do the construction over the winter and into the spring. It's about nine acres. Uh, we'll be putting about a two and a half foot uh, cover on the site. Uh, we will be reinstalling the irrigation. We'll be reinstalling the paths. We'll be working with uh, the folks that uh, we partner with on the soccer program to have it graded in a way that we can lay back out the soccer fields to be able to continue the soccer program. Uh, we expect the uh, response from the EPA late summer of this year, 2015, uh, but we want to give the turf a season to grow in, so our intent right now is the site would be available again for use for athletics again in 2016. Uh, thank you. Uh, comments? Yes, uh, from uh, President Pro Tem Mills. Thank you, Councilmember Craig. Director McKnight, could you um, help provide our listening and viewing audience the clarity from the options that were selected, particularly as it makes reference to less disturbance of the soil being a safer option and also the engagement of the health department, the city's health department, as we <coughs> move forward in terms of the health of that community? Councilmember Mills, President Gunther, Councilmember Craig, members of Council. Um, yes, the um, the through the remediation uh, remediation action plan process with the uh, Burgess and Nipel and with the Ohio EPA, ultimately they identified four options for remediation of the site. Um, the one that we selected is the one we brought for you this evening, which is to bring two and a half feet of cover essentially over the entire site. We'll say that's very similar to what was done on the Whittier Peninsula with the Audubon Park and the impound lot when the city vacated the impound lot, Metro Parks working with the city basically put a two foot cap on that entire site. The other options included one, removing about two and a half feet of soil and bringing in two and a half feet of soil. Another option was to take the existing soil that is contaminated, kind of push it to the side, berm it up and then cover the entire site. The Last, the fourth option then was to basically flip-flop the soil. In other words, take the contaminated soil off, stockpile it over here, dig down to an additional two and a half feet, average of two and a half feet, bring up clean soil, put the contaminated soil back in the deeper hole, and then bring the, the soil that was clean that we dug up back on top. And then we would cap that with or cover that with six inches of topsoil. In meeting with both our consultants, uh, the EPA, other city departments and uh, administration, we ultimately determined that the, the, the solution of putting a two and a half foot cover on a site was the least disruptive. It did not disturb the soil. It did not create dust in that construction of the contaminated soil, uh, which was a concern, and would seal that soil, seal that site, uh, so that we could um, continue to use it. I will also say that as part of this process, we will be required to annually prepare a report back to the Ohio EPA that we've expected the site on an annual basis to make sure that the work that was done is in place, has not been disturbed uh, in any way. Uh, the EPA actually requires a covenant to be put on the property that's recorded with the deed. So if, even if the city came back and decided to sell the property 20 years from now, and someone had wanted to build homes on it, for example, that, that deed restriction is attached to the property, so no one can come in and do anything without doing any additional uh, remediation if it's needed for that change of use. Uh, essentially what we're doing is uh, re remediating this site for recreational use so that we can come back and use it for those athletic facilities. Uh, was your question answered, uh, President Pro Tem Mills? Also, uh, there was a relationship with the uh, Columbus Health Department uh, regarding this, because our expectation is that this study is both thorough, 
uh, and effective with regard to our families. We certainly understand the concerns of the community uh, and their appropriate concerns uh, regarding the safety of families and children. Uh, and it's our expectation, again, as the director has mentioned, uh, that we have uh, annual reports regarding the safety um, uh, and viability of that area uh, as young people and families will be utilizing that space. Uh, any further comments, Director, regarding this matter? Um, yes, we did work with Columbus Health. They have done some uh, surveys of, of area residents. Uh, also, the EPA is doing some additional survey work of residential properties uh, contiguous to, you know, all of this was created by this fertilizer plant, uh, which was just north of the park uh, back in the, started back in the early 1900s and operated until 1970. Um, so the EPA is also testing some of the residential properties adjacent there as well. Uh, I don't believe they're going to have their test results back till mid-November sometime. However, the park, the remediation of the park is not conditioned on their results. Those will be handled by the EPA as a separate issue once they have their results. And again, as we've had the community meetings, the EPA has been in both community meetings and we've talked about that process as well. Okay. Uh, any additional questions? If there are no additional questions, uh, I move for passage. Oh, I'm sorry. I know he has declined. Okay. Uh, I think we can. Yes. Craig Harden Klein, Mills Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Uh, thank you. That is all that I have this evening. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Craig. Our next committee is the Public Service and Transportation Committee. Councilmember Hardin chairs that committee. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Ginther. Uh, tonight in Public Service and Transportation uh, Committee, we have Ordinance 2215-2014 to authorize the City Auditor to appropriate and transfer nine, uh, $999,580.85 from the Preserve TIF Fund and to appropriate and transfer $349,871.48 from the Special Income Tax Fund and to preserve the TIF Fund to authorize the City Auditor to transfer monies between funds within the Department of Public Service to authorize the City Auditor to appropriate $2,675,301.05 within the State Issue 2 Street Projects Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Danbert, Inc to provide for payment of the contract and construction administration and inspection services in the connection with the arterial street rehabilitation Morse Road preservative improvements phase one project and to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of two million six hundred seventy five thousand three hundred and one dollars and five cents from the state issue two street projects fund and to declare an emergency if there are no questions I move for passage Craig Hardin Klein, Mills Payne, Tyson, President Ginther. Next, we have Ordinance 2237 2014 to authorize the City Auditor to transfer monies between object levels within the Department of Public Service, Streets and Highway Bonds Fund to authorize the City Auditor to transfer monies between funds within the Department of Public Service to authorize the City Auditor to appropriate $2,350,063.21 within the Local Transportation Improvement Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Danbert, Inc. to provide for a payment of construction, administration, and inspection services in connection with the roadway improvements, 18th Street Project to approve expenditure of up to $2,350,063.21 from the Local Transportation Improvement Fund and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions, I move for passage. Second. Craig Hunt Klein, Mills Pele Tyson, President Ginther. Also, we have Ordinance 2238. 2014 to amend the 2014 capital improvement budget to authorize the city auditor to transfer cash and appropriation between projects within the street and highway bonds fund to, uh, to authorize the director of public service to enter into a contract with DeBraw Kumpel Inc. for the replacement of HVAC equipment and to waive competitive bidding requirements of city code to authorize expenditure of up to $135,636 from the streets and highways bonds fund and to declare an emergency. 
Um, Director Davies, could you give us some uh, background on the waiver, please? Yes, Chairman Harden, President Ginther, members of council. This company was uh, previously awarded through a competitive bidding process, both the annual preventative maintenance and emergency HVAC repair contract at our 25th Avenue facility, along with other public service facilities. Um, the equipment in question currently isn't working properly, and it's been determined that the current um, air-cooled chillers and evaporators are obsolete, and repairing the equipment would be uh, impractical due to the age. Therefore, we recommend using the same contractor to install the equipment to, that will also be maintaining the equipment and uh, holding the warranty in place. If you have any qu other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Director. Uh, if there are no further questions, I move for passage. Second. Kirkham Klein, Mills Paley Tyson, President Ginther. And last, we have Ordinance 2280 2014 to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Budget to authorize the City Auditor to appropriate $310,724.13 from the unappropriated balance of the Street and Highway Bonds Fund. To authorize the City Auditor to transfer cash and appropriation within the Streets and Highway bond fund to authorize the director of public service to enter into contract with g and g cement contractors llc to provide for payment of construction administration and inspection services in connection with this resurfacing 2014 brick rehabilitation project to authorize the expenditure of up to one million six hundred eleven thousand five hundred and four dollars and fifty seven cents from the streets and highways bond and to declare an emergency if there are no questions i move for passage Second. Craig Hearn, Klein, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. And that's all we have in public service tonight. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Hardin. At this point, if uh, my colleagues are in agreement, I'd like to uh, entertain a motion to recess uh, regular meeting number uh, 53. So moved. Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Craig Hearn, Klein, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. We are in recess and we will reconvene uh, in just a few minutes for uh, Sony, 6.30. <laughs> <laughs>
192 North Guilford Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 43222. The proposed use is garden with accessory storage in a private garage. Franklinton Area Commission recommended approval. The City Department's recommendation is approval. Are there any questions or comments from Council Members? First, I'd like to move to waive second reading. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden, Clinton, Miles Peter, Tyson, President Ginther. Second reading waived. Now I move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden, Klein, Miles Peter, Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. Next, we have 2224 2014 to rezone 1774 North High Street 43202, being 0 0.58 plus or minus acres located on the east side of North High Street, 73 plus or minus feet south of 14th Avenue from CPD, Commercial Plan Development District, to CPD, Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is Black Wilshire Ridgely, LLC, care of David Hodge, Smith & Hale, LLC, 37 West Broad Street, Suite 460, Columbus, Ohio, 43215. The proposed use is commercial development. The University Area Commission recommendation is approval. The City Department's recommendation is approval. The Development Commission recommendation was approval on September 11, 2014. Any comments or questions from council members? If not, I would move to amend to emergency. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden, Klein, Miles Perry, Tyson, President Ginther. Amended to emergency. Now I move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden, Klein, Miles Perry, Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. Next, we have 2244 2014 to rezone 68 Lazelle Road 43235. Being 17.46 plus or minus acres located on the north side of Lazelle Road, 450 plus or minus feet west of Arnold Place from L A R L D Limited Apartment Residential and R Rural Districts to L A to L A R L D Limited Apartment Residential District. The applicant is Metro Development LLC, care of Deanna R. Cook, attorney, 52 East Gay Street. Columbus, Ohio, 43215. The proposed use is multi-unit residential development. The City Department's recommendation is approval. The Development Commission recommendation was approval on September 11, 2014. Any questions or comments from Council Members? If not, I move to waive second reading. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Clerk, Harden, Klein, Miles Peter, Tyson, President Ginther. Next, I move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden Klein, Miles Perry, Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. Next is 2245 2014 to grant a variance from the pre provisions of Section 3312.27, parking setback line of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 80 Lazelle Road, 43235, to permit a reduced parking setback line for an apartment complex in the L A R L D Limited Apartment Residential District. The applicant is Metro Development, LLC, care of Deanna Cook, attorney, 52 East Gay Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43215. The proposed use is reduced parking setback line for an apartment complex. The City Department's recommendation is approval. Any questions or comments from Council Members? Seeing none, move to waive second reading. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden Klein, Miles Perry, Tyson, President Ginther. Second reading waived. I move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden Klein, Miles Perry, Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. Next is 2263 2014 to rezone 1281 Edge Hill Road, 43212, being 2.9 plus or minus acres located on the west side of Edge Hill Road, 443 plus or minus feet north of West Third Avenue. From M, Manufacturing District to AR2, Apartment Residential District. The applicant is Continental Bell Limited, care of David L. Hodge, attorney, Smith & Hale, LLC, 37 West Broad Street, Suite 460, Columbus 43215. The proposed use is multi-unit residential development. Fifth by Northwest Area Commission recommendation is approval. The City Department's recommendation is approval. Development Commission recommendation uh, approval on July 10th, 2014. Any questions or comments from council members? Seeing none, first I'd move to amend to emergency. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden, Klein, Miles Perry, Tyson, President Ginther. 
amended to emergency. Now move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Colonel Cotton Klein, West Pennington, President Ginther. Passed. Next is 2264 to uh, 2014 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3333.18, building lines, and 3333.255, perimeter yard, Columbus City Codes for the property located 1281 at Edge Hill Road, 43212, to permit reduced setbacks for an apartment complex in the AR2 apartment residential district. The applicant is Continental Bell Limited, care of David Hodge, Turney, Smith & Hale, LLC, 37 West Broad Street, Suite 460, Columbus, Ohio, 43215. The proposed use is apartment complex with reduced setbacks. Fifth by Northwest Area Commission recommendation is approval. The City Department's recommendation is approval. Any questions or comments from council members regarding this legislation? Seeing none, I move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Cardin Klein, Wells Perry Tyson, President Ginther. Amended as submitted to the clerk. Next, move to amend to emergency. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Cardin Klein, Wells Perry Tyson, President Ginther. Amended to emergency. And finally, move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Cardin Klein, Wells Perry Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. Next is 2277 2014. To grant a variance from the provisions of section 3333.255, perimeter yard, Columbus City Codes for the property located at 4692 Kenny Road, 43220, to permit reduced perimeter yard and the LAR1 limited apartment residential district for an apartment complex. The applicant is Preferred Real Estate Investments 2, LLC, Jill Tangeman, Attorney, 52 East Gay Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43215. The proposed use is multi-unit residential development. The City Department's recommendation is approval. Any questions or comments regarding legislation from council members? Seeing none, first I move to amend to emergency. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Hardin Klein, Wells Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Amended to emergency. Now I move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Hardin Klein, Wells Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. And finally this evening, we have 1834-2014 uh, to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3345.04, Planned Unit Development District, and 3312.49, minimum uh, numbers of parking spaces required of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 3137 Jake Place, 43219, to permit a Type A home daycare facility for a maximum of 12 children within an existing single unit dwelling and reduce num number of required parking spaces in the PUD 8 planned unit development district and to declare an emergency. The applicant is Angelique Diem, 3137 Jake Place, Columbus, Ohio, 43219. The proposed use is a type A home daycare facility. The city department's recommendation is approval. Um, I know we have one speaker. So on the advice of the city attorney's office, we ask that anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against any council variants, including staff, please stand at this time, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. Repeat after me, I, I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. Thank you very much. First of all, we will ask for uh, staff presentation. Good evening. The requested council variance will allow a type A home daycare facility to operate within an existing single unit dwelling in the PUD 8 planned unit development district. The PUD 8 planned unit development district does not permit type A daycare facilities. The site is within the planning area of the Northeast Area Plan, which recommends low-density residential uses for this location. Since the primary use of the property will still be a single-unit dwelling, staff has no objection to the requested Type A home daycare use, which must comply with the Ohio Revised Code requirements and be inspected by the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services. Therefore, staff's recommendation is for approval. Thank you.
Next, I'd uh, call on the uh, applicant. Uh, if you have a presentation or a statement, Ms. Uh, Angelique Diam. Ms. Diam, are you present? Would you come forward to the podium? If you would just uh, share your name, address, uh, and I know that we tabled this some time ago, and if there's any update or information that you could share with council since uh, uh, we considered this a while back. Then I'll have, I know there are a couple of, at least one speaker, Ms. Karen White, that I'll have come up and speak, and then uh, may call you back up to answer questions if there are any. But uh, Ms. Diem, any updates to this? Uh, my name is Angelique Diem, 3137 Jake Place. Um, there's no update still. I'm requesting for type A, which allow with my two, I have two children of my own. Maximum of children I will have in my house will be 12 children, including my own. Uh, last time I talked to a, a worker from the state to see if it was possible for me to limit to eight or nine, but she said that they will come and inspect my home to make sure that it was safe enough to hold to house up to 12 children and. There's no way they could put it in papers that I can only have eight children. Um, but I, I can choose to have less than 12. I can, right now I have um, five children that come at a time. As I mentioned last time, my goal is not to necessarily have 12 children in my house, but it's also for the reimbursement rate for type A is better than the type B. Um, uh, my backyard is fenced, so the children do not go anywhere beyond my yard. Um, so I would love to see what the, the other neighbor, where her objection is and what she would like to see happen. Um, the youngest, the oldest child I have that come Monday through Friday is four years old. I have a, a seven-year-old and an eight-year-old and a six-year-old that come on Saturday. So, but other than that, Monday through Friday, the oldest I have is four years old, and they all leave by 6 p.m. Uh, last time I mentioned that I have uh, two part-time children that come overnight, and they are nine months and three years old. So the children are not outside making a lot of noise. I don't want that for the neighbors. Uh, I have been living in that neighborhood for six years now. And prior to that, I never encounter uh, the neighbor that's objecting to this. Um, but I don't know what objection is, but they, they have went too far as far as even taking pictures of the kids in the backyard, which I don't understand why they're doing that. And they have even contacted the county to ask for my records. Um, so I don't know why they would go that far. I have no relationship with them. None of my parents have ever com uh, complained against me, so I just don't appreciate the level that they're going to invade my privacy. Thank you, uh, Ms. Dion, for uh, your thoughts. If you would uh, stay nearby, we'll ask uh, the speaker to come forward and uh, share her thoughts, and then we may call you uh, back up for a rebuttal or if there are any other questions or comments from uh, council members. Uh, we have one speaker against uh, this legislation this evening, uh, Ms. Karen White. Ms. White, welcome to Council Chambers. If you would make your uh, way to the podium, share your name, address, any organizations you represent, and you have uh, three minutes. Okay. My name is Karen White, and I live behind um, uh, the applicant for this variance. And um, I'm just going to give you briefly a brief background of this. Um, initially, when I noticed that she wanted to be a type B provider, um, we had the first reading at Howard Recreation Center. And basically, she didn't have a fence at that time. So her, the kids were running in people's backyards and playing in people's backyard. And at the Howard reading, I said, I really think you need a fence. And, there, and may, I want to make sure that you're adhering by the rules and regulations in order to be a type B. So basically, um, we were supposed to have a second reading at Howard, and then she came and approached us, you know, me and my neighbor Vanessa that lived behind her, and I said, 
she said, what issues can we do to resolve this? I said, I don't have any issues. You need to get a fence. And I said, by the way, you know, because when she was going to be a type B provider, I made sure I researched what the rules and regs and equipment is for a type B provider is. So I said, you need to get a fence. And by the way, I read the rules for a type B. You need to make sure that they're not using the trampoline. Because I gave you the rules last time we were here, and I said, the, and I still I have the rules this time too. I said the kids are not supposed to be on the trampoline. The rule clearly states that the provider shall not allow children in care to use trampolines. So I told her this before she even got the fence that she shouldn't be using the trampoline because it's in the rule. So basically, um, you know, she didn't do anything at that at that time. And then um, she continued using it. And I told Vanessa, I said, wow, she's still using that even though it's in the rules. I don't have any, any problem. I just want to make sure if you're doing something, you're going to be following the rules and regulations to be a type B provider. And if you're not following the rules for this, you're probably not going to follow the rules as a type A. So basically, um, when she kept using it, she stood here last time under oath, said that the county came out and inspected her property and said that it was okay to use a trampoline. Well, I went down to research it and pulled her, it's a public records request to see if it was allowable and also have her public uh, applicant that says no trampolines are permitted. And it also has a statement here saying that she does have a, uh, the provider has a trampoline, but she will not have the kids use it. So that's contradictory what she's saying, that she's letting these kids use equipment that are not safe and that are in the rule. So I have a problem with, if you're not doing this rule, what else are you doing that, that's not, you know, that, that's not going to be followed? You know, and I told her, I said, and how is it that I know the rule and you don't know the rule as a, pro a provider B? And I even told her, I said, by the way, you, that the, the rule states that you can't use a trampoline. And yeah, I took pictures because I went down to meet with the county and they had an issue with that too. They're like, no, it clearly states here that they can't have a trampoline and they're not supposed to be using it for the safety of the kids. So, you know, basically, if you're not, you're, if you're not following the rules, then you don't need to be a provider. Thank you, Ms. White. Any uh, questions or comments for Ms. White uh, and I have before the... we have a uh, council member Mills? Ms. White, I just want to understand your comments in regards to her operation as a type A home daycare provider as opposed to the variance that she's applying for. Mm -hmm. you, you it's about her operating as a day that it, your discussion and concerns are seem to be well placed with the county and their licensure and her permit as opposed to the variance. Well, the variance basically, that. when I was here last time, I stated that I did not wish to have it because I consider my backyard as my sanctuary. And I didn't want the noise. I didn't want, you know, the extra, you know, uh, the property value to decline. I didn't want that because it's like if I'm working all day and I come home and I want to be in my backyard, I want to be able to, you know, relax and enjoy myself. I don't want to, um, you know, be listening to, you know, to, like I'm on a playground basically. And the fence has been installed since then. Can you share your thoughts about the fence? Uh, I have no problems with the fence. My problem is, again, with, you know, her using equipment that she shouldn't be using and then the property values and as far as, um, you know, the noise, if I want to enjoy my backyard, that's the prob um, problem I have with it. And my problem is, too, is if, again, you know, once this is said and done, you all will be gone. We'll still be there. And it's like, who's going to be adhering to make sure that she's following the rules when all this is done and said with? And just so I'm clear, the rules of operating as a type A daycare provider, which the county licenses, right? That's your concern? The county licenses type right. A. The okay. um, state licenses. Type right, but a. her operation and being monitored when you make the reference to who's going to be checking right. on her yeah, operation, exactly. that's is placed with with the the county yes, license. Correct, correct. Just so okay. Right. Just want to make sure. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or com comments for Ms. White? Ms. White, thank you for coming down this evening and for uh, sharing your thoughts on this legislation.
Ms. Uh, Diem, any uh, additional um, comments that you would like to make in the rebuttal or? Okay. And I guess maybe if they could be focused on the land use and the variance uh, at question, I, I, I do understand Ms. White's concerns about the rules and regulations set forth by the county, but what we're considering here tonight is uh, the variance and the land use issue. As, as the rule states, uh, to be a type A, you have to be a resident of that home. So I'm not planning to leave the home. It will, be, it will continue to be my residency. Uh, I am following the rules and the regulation. I do know the rules and the regulations. Um, I, I, I just don't appreciate a neighbor taking pictures of kids, people's kids in the backyard. The county is aware that I have a trampoline. It is not, a, I'm not doing anything against the rule. I can have my children on the trampoline and my friend's children on the trampoline. It is for the, I wrote a statement that I will not have daycare kids on the trampoline. And I don't have daycare kids on the trampoline. When she was taking pictures, I had my friend's kids over that day. And that just, I feel like that's out of question to even be taking pictures of children, people's children. And I will continue to follow the rules if the county or the states uh, feel that I'm doing anything against the rules that will take my license away. Uh, with all due respect, it is not Ms. Karen's job to be reporting me or to be taking pictures. There are people who are there. I have case managers who are over me who do their job. So she has to allow the county and the state to do their job. Thank you, uh, Ms. Dion. Any uh, questions or comments from council members for Ms. Dion? Any questions or comments before we proceed? Uh, first, I'd like to move to take from the table. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Hearn McLean, Ms. Peter Tyson, President Ginther. Second, uh, would like to move to amend to emergency. Is there a second? Clerk, clerk call the roll. Craig Harding Klein, Ms. Peter Tyson, President Ginther. Amended to emergency. And finally, move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harding Klein, Ms. Peter Tyson, President Ginther. Legislation passes. Anything else to come before the zoning committee this evening? If not, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn regular meeting number 54. So moved. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden Klein, Mills Perry Tyson, President Ginther. We stand adjourned. Entertain a motion to reconvene regular meeting number 53. Move to reconvene. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden Klein, Mills Perry Tyson, President Ginther. We will reconvene regular meeting number 53. Our next committee is the Public Safety and Judiciary Committee. Council Member Klein chairs that committee. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Uh, two pieces in Public Safety and Judiciary. The first is 21. 16-2014 to authorize the municipal court clerk to enter into a contract with 3SG Corporation for the provision of software maintenance services for the Franklin County Municipal Court imaging system to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code to authorize an expenditure of $24,947.82 for the municipal court clerk computer fund and to declare an emergency. Uh, this waiver of competitive bidding by the municipal clerk is being requested to continue a, uh, an imaging contract that is currently under place and to, uh, in order to continue to receive state contract long-term pricing. Uh, any questions or comments? I move for passage. Craig Hunt Klein, Ms. Peter Tyson, President Ginther. 21-71-2014 to authorize the Director of Departments of Finance and Management and Public Safety to enter into contracts for the purchase of miscellaneous equipment from multiple vendors for the new crime lab to authorize the expenditure of $100,000 from the safety voted bond fund and to declare an emergency. Uh, Director Speaks. Thank you, Chairperson Klein, uh, President Ginther, members of council. 
Uh, the purpose of this ordinance is simply to acquire uh, various technology uh, uh, software and hardware for our new crime lab that's being built. Uh, mainly, it is looking at barcode scanners uh, and printers for all the various pieces of evidence that come into our property room. So we appreciate your consideration of this ordinance. Any questions for the director? I move for passage. Craig Harden Klein, Los Bailey Tyson, President Ginther. Moving to public utilities. 1976-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into professional engineering services agreement with Stantec Consulting for the division of sewage and drainage for the Big Walnut Trunk Extension Phase 2 project to transfer within and expend up to $1,241,262.13 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Project. Any questions for Director Davies? I move for passage by voice vote. Craig? Yes. Harden? Yes. Klein? Yes. Mills? Paley? Oh, yes. Tyson? Yes. President Gidler? Next is 2093-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a construction contract with PAE and Associates for the Upper Scioto West Air Quality Improvements Project to authorize the transfer within and the expenditures of $2,235,600 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Project. Uh, Director Davies. Uh, Chairman Klein, President Ginther, members of Council, this is a 20-year-old tunnel you might recall it was was uh, tunneled uh, along the Scioto River, moving up towards Dublin. Uh, when we constructed the tunnel, we also installed some biofilters to deal with uh, odors. And we, since this was constructed, 20 years has passed, we have better technology now. And obviously the biofilters are old as well, so we are simply demolishing them and replacing them with better technology. So this is odors from the sewer um, with the air that's gonna escape to clean the air? That's correct. For its foulness? It's similar to what we did downtown with uh, uh, the biofilters that are up at uh, near the arena district. Thank you, Director Davies. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Craig Ryan Klein, Los Bailey Tyson, President Ginther. 2204 2014 to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to enter into a contract with Protect hmm, Collapse company for the purchase of thermoplastic tanker lining replacement for the division of water to authorize the expenditure of $39,949.80 from the water operating fund to waive competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code and declare an emergency. Director. Uh, Chairman Klein, President Ginther, members of council, uh, the reason for the request for waiving is when we bid this we had one, <clears throat> excuse me, one respondent. They had made an error uh, in writing out their proposal. We put it back out for bid again. We got one respondent, it was the same respondent. Uh, they made a similar mistake that was minor in discussing the issue with the purchasing office. They said if you're gonna, it didn't make sense to bid it again because we were likely gonna have the same uh, one bidder, so it was just better to go ahead and negotiate with them. So we only had one bidder throughout this entire Twice, time and it was yes, this company? Correct. Okay, any questions or comments additional to that? I move for passage. Craig Harden Klein, Los Paley Tyson, President Ginther. The final piece in public utilities is 2239 2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to negotiate and enter into a contract for purchase power to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code, to authorize the expenditure of $1 from the Electricity Operating Fund, and to declare an emergency. Sir? Uh, Chairman Klein, President Ginther, members of Council, uh, as you know, we've done this probably four or five times in the past three years where we put out a bid for purchase power. Uh, purchase power prices have been very low. It has allowed us to stabilize the division of power. Uh, this is unique in that prices are so volatile, uh, the situation's backwards where we actually get permission from city council for me to put the RFP out and then get proposals and then negotiate immediately uh, because of the fact that the prices do not hold more than a day or two given that market. So uh, this is similar to how we've done this the past three or four times and uh, we've been very successful, saved millions of dollars, and currently have uh, purchase power secured through 2020. And will this contract pick up after 2020? Yes, we're hoping to 12, 12 to 18 months. Okay. Any questions or comments for the director? Seeing none, I move for passage. Craig Harden Klein, Los Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Council President, I have one piece in technology. May I proceed? 
1472-2014 to authorize the Director of Department of Technology to enter into a contract with Fishnet Security Inc. to provide an in-case cybersecurity software solution with service for a, per a period of one year from the date of the certified purchase order. To waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code to authorize the expenditure of $67,295.20 and to declare an emergency. Deputy Director Bodie, can you comment on the waiving competitive bidding provision? Yes. Uh, Chairman Klein, President Ginther, members of council. Um, much like uh, any software we purchase within the city, a lot of times the warranty information is uh, deviates from our standard contract terms and conditions. Therefore, we have to submit it as a bid waiver. It was competitively bid and awarded to the lowest uh, responsive and responsible bidder. So with that, uh, I appreciate your consideration for this legislation. So this matches up with the warranty of the original legislation? Correct. What happens is a lot of times we'll have the actual manufacturer and it goes through a vendor or a third party reseller. And what they do is the terms of the warranty are passed through to us in the city. For them to be able to award that to us or to be able to work with that contract, they cannot modify that warranty. So anytime we're submitting legislation that includes software, we submit it as a bid waiver. I got it. Thank you for that explanation, Deputy Director. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Craig Harden Klein, Los Paley Tyson, President Ginther. And Council President, uh, that's all I have in my committees. Thank you, uh, Councilmember uh, Klein. Our next committee is the Development Committee. President Pro Tem Mills chairs that committee. Madam Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Ginther. Tonight in the Development Committee are the following ordinances, beginning with Ordinance 2188-2014 to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with McDaniels Construction Corp, Inc. for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 years on new construction of a corporate headquarters in consideration of a proposed total investment of approximately $1.1 million dollars. Incorporated in 1987, McDaniels Construction is a contractor that undertakes construction projects of all types and sizes. McDaniels Construction is proposing to invest $1.1 million in new construction, which includes furniture and fixtures, to build a new corporate headquarters consisting of roughly 10,000 square feet. The company will create two new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $90,000 and retain 15 full-time employees with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $1.48 million at the projected site located at 1069 Woodland Avenue within the City of Columbus Central Enterprise Zone. If there are no comments or questions, I move for passage. Craig Harden Klein, Mills Payne Tyson, President Get There. Next, have Ordinance 2216-2014 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a Columbus Downtown Office Incentive Agreement with RTTW Limited doing business as Tree Tree as provided in Columbus City Council Resolution 0088X-2007 adopted June 4, 2007. In 2011, they decided to, to do for themselves tree tree what they have done for their clients by developing a new market position and strategy. In formulating this new position, Tree Tree recognized a need in the market that fell between design shops and larger agencies that are going after contracts to be the agency of record. The company successfully carved out a unique niche in the industry that ignited the agency's rapid growth. And most recently, Tree Tree was named number 506 on the 2014 INC 5000 list and was the fifth highest ranking Columbus area company to make the list. If there are no comments or questions, I'd like to move for passage. Craig Harden Klein, Mills Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next, I have Ordinance 2382-2014 to adopt consolidated submission for community planning and development programs, including a consolidated plan, the related citizen participant plan, and the action plan to authorize the filing of the consolidated submission with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and to declare an emergency. I'd like to move to table this ordinance indefinitely pending the public hearing on October 22nd at 5 p.m. and also for a period of public comment. If there are no comments or questions, I'd like to move to table this ordinance. Craig Harden Klein, Mills Paley Tyson, President Ginther. That's all I have in, in uh, legislation this evening, President Ginther. I'd like to move to two announcements if you allow me the opportunity. 
I'd like to congratulate uh, Whetstone High School. On September 17, 2014, Whetstone High School was awarded first place in the high school division AA in the American Red Cross 2013-2014 Life Sharing Challenge. The Life Sharing Challenge is a yearly competition among organizations sponsoring blood drives. Organizations receive points during the year based on the number of blood drives, blood drive success, number of first-time donors, and employee participation. Congratulations to Whetstone for caring for their community and the most tremendous need in terms of blood donation. Thank you to all the students, the staff, and all those who participated to make them rise to the top. Thank you for their care of our community. That's all I have this evening. Thank you, uh, Council Member Mills. Uh, is there any, anything else to come before Council this evening? If not, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. We do have several non-agenda speakers we'll take momentarily. So move. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Harden Klein, Mills Paley, Tyson, President Kinther. We stand adjourned. We'll take non-agenda speakers momentarily.